just say to you that if if a wonderful presentation that Neil's done, and, it, and if we had someone of Neil's ilk in every town in this country, just one person of that ilk, then we wouldn't be in the state we're in. Yeah. And, that, and that's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm genuinely telling you that, right? And, and Neil, in fact, has helped me in, in, my, in my road to travel. I've been doing this many years, many years before a lot of people perhaps. And I was in the common law perspective and looking at it because I was, I was seeing from the common law position, I'd been involved in crimes as a younger man and all that, and I'd read all the criminal law, which if you look go through criminal uh, process and procedure, it's very precise. And as a younger man, I, you know, Archibald was the book we looked at, which was the only book we looked at. We didn't look at nothing else, yeah? And so when I started getting to the common law perspective, I thought, yeah, yeah, this is all right. But of course, when you go into a magistrate's court talking about Halsbury's, it's completely over everyone's head. You know, nobody understands what's going on. And it was Neil that pointed me in the right direction, really, when I, I got a case, which I'll explain in a bit, about British gas, and how I was charged uh, by British gas with extracting electricity, which I wasn't. And uh, ultimately, I had a Crown Court trial in front of a jury, um, which I'll go on about. But Neil had come and explained to me about the, getting involved in the, the, the devils in the detail. And so, I then took up what he said and uh, examined it, and then I, I then, further from that, met Mr. Ebert, um, who has written a book called The Forensics of Legal Fraud, and Mr. Ebert is an expert in the areas he does, which is um, bankruptcy and possession orders. And so I, when I started learning about that, then my whole world changed, so I got Neil to thank for that. So, Anyway, I'm going to say something what Mr. Evers asked me to say about this meeting, and which he'd which like to get across, because he's not able to get here. Um, but I'll, I'll, and I'll, and I'll just say this, right, okay? And, right. It's a this is fantastic, and, but we should be tackling the culture. The culture is what the problem is. Because you all know, right, if you went to work in a factory, you go there and the bosses will come down and they'll say to you, You've got to do this, you've got to do that, and we start doing what we're told to do, right? We start moving about, doing, doing shit, right? And then all of a sudden, when the bosses have gone, all the shop floor come over and they go, What are you doing? Don't get doing that, man. You'll get us in trouble. Do this, do that. Do that. So, what are you going to do? You're going to do what all the shop floor are doing, or are you going to do what you're told? You do what the shop floor tell you to do, really, and truthfully, because of peer pressure. And this is what is going on inside the judiciary. And this is going on inside the judiciary. We have criminal elements at its very top, seeping down, and that's why all the money's coming from, to try and keep people in support of them. But ultimately, it's the culture. And when you go into there, and what Neil was saying earlier, it becomes standard procedure. They don't even know what a court seal is. They don't know what a court seal is. But yet they're still rubber stamping away, yeah? with, a, with a court stamp, not a court seal. So it's the culture, and it's the culture that we need to attack. So what Mr. Ock ever just said, that. Law-abiding citizens are subject and victims of the culture, the conduct of the financial institutions, Her Majesty's Court and Tribunal Service, the legal profession, the insolvency service, the official receiver, accountants, members of IPA, the police controlled by the judiciary to prevent these things, and the criminal conduct of this so-called culture, and support, which supports money laundering, forging, public, forging of public instruments, and to enable the, the criminal organised crime to to use Her Majesty's law enforcement to torture, harass, and defraud millions of law-abiding citizens from their assets. Which is, which is exactly right. Everyone ultimately we, blames the banks. Let's blame the, and they've got a lot of shit to answer for. Let's blame the banks. But the banks are supported by the judiciary. And the judiciary is supported by these, these flakes, these, these trustees and these, these receivers and these people who are, who are gathering people's assets up. So the whole system, and you could say, well, they can't all be involved in, in, in a crime. Surely not, right? Well, if you know, I've been, you know, as a younger man, I've been involved in a lot. I was involved in a lot of crime, and, and I haven't been for twenty odd years, right? But I've been involved in. I've been charged with eight conspiracies, right? And conspiracy is the hardest charge in law to prove, but the easiest to charge you with. It's over. It's an overriding charge. So they'll charge you with conspiracy to commit a ro armed robbery, right? And I've been in jail when I was a younger man with people who've been charged with uh, uh, conspiracy to commit an, an, an unknown uh, uh, burglary or uh, uh, robbery, 
unknown premises, at unknown time, with unknown place, with unknown persons. And they'll be held in custody for six months. <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely. And then six months later, they're booted out the door. Right? Because it's the easiest one to hold you on. It's, the, it's a sticker, right? It's what they call throw the biggest lump of shit at someone, right? And that, 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 that something will stick. We'll end up with a, oh, I don't know, a theft charge or something, right? But ultimately, the first charge. So when we look at these, what's going on, when you charge with conspiracy, it's patronation. So patronation is what it is. If, if Neil is in Liverpool and I'm in Hereford and I don't know him and you're in Swindon and you're in... How can we all be committing the same crime? Well, because we all work for a corporation called perhaps Barclays. And Barclays seem to be giving out the same information. And you, you'll see in criminal gangs, you know, what happens is people don't know each other, but they're all still doing the same thing. It's called patronation. And the captains or the lieutenants of that crime gang are going around. They're the oil in the works of the machinery of the crime. And that's what we've got. So ultimately, um, you know, everything Neil said is like, you know, I, I salute him. He's uh, absolutely fantastic. And, and in fact, he took a lot of the stuff I was going to say. But <laughs> 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 he generally did, you know, that, like CPR 40.2 and all that. But, but the point is, we, so, so what we've done is, and I was going into, into court, and I was taking a backgammon board into a chess match. So I knew it was all correct, and I'd go in there, and I'll give him all this and what. Nobody's taking any notes of me. Now, because they don't even know what I'm talking about, really, in truth. But I'm taking a backgammon board to a chess match. Well, now, and again, thanks to Neil, and thanks to Mr. Ebert, I'm taking the chess board into the chess match, but I'll put me backgammon board under here, just in case you want to ride with that after. Right? <laughs> and that's what we're doing, and that's what we're doing. And what we've discovered, and this is going on all over the country, because what would happen is one of, someone would be made, for instance, bankrupt. And they might have a multi-million pound business, like Mr. Fab, David Fab there. And also you, you think, what the hell's happened? And the whole world collapses on you. And of course, it's, well, we don't talk about our own private matters. The reality of it is, is they know that. You don't want to talk about these things. And you think that you've done something wrong, you've messed up, and people commit suicide, like what we're saying. People, you know, the whole families get ruined. So what is it? Ultimately, it's terrorism. Yeah. Terrorism. And you know, the first time I issued a commercial lien, which isn't a commercial lien, which I'll explain to you later, it's a notarial instrument, which has the, the uh, perspective of being a commercial lien, right? But I didn't know it back in those days. When I first in, 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 it did that, I got arrested and, and, and locked up because under the Terrorism Act, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm afraid the banks are, are guilty of terrorism all day long. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They're terrorising people, right? Mm -hmm. Under the civil law, under civil process. Not very civil, is it? <laughs> and the, there are a couple of things we have to know about civil process. And, and, and again, Neil's hit on this. But this is, I, I try and simplify things because, as Terence McKenna says, if it ain't simple, you haven't thought about it long enough. Right? So just think of this. And it's, t and it's taken me about eight years to work this out. So silly like that, right? Abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. <laughs> We've got it there, innit? Okay? The whole of the statutory process and procedure is a river that runs on the, co on the, on the riverbed of common law. And so it's all got to obviously be operating inside the law, on the law. And so abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. Just go to Wikipedia and check it out. Abuse of process. It's a common law offence. It's not anything to do with statutes or acts. It has to go back to the common law. So that in itself is a very good understanding. When you're in a... I've been in many courts, you know, the last time I was in a court in Belfast with Roger Hayes and we had uh, nine police and uh, <coughs> security officers and all the rest of it around just trying to frighten us into, into folding up in this Belfast court. And we held to a position but of course we knew it was abusive process and they said it wasn't a common law venue. Well, common law, let's remove the word law, chuck it in the bin, right? And let's change the word law for sense. Because that's why that's why that's what common law is. Common law is actually is actually physically common sense. That's why it doesn't need to be written down, because it's common sense. And that's why it moves from moment to moment. Hey, maybe we didn't used to have cars, maybe we didn't used to have some sort of, you know, uh, electronic gear. It's moved, okay? But it's ultimately it's common sense. And it's that sense that you must realise. We can't know 110,000 statutes. Look, look, Neil said it would take 40 years to read them, right? 400. Or 100, 100 <laughs> or whatever. But what we do know is we know common sense. And so ignorance of common sense is no excuse. Because you've got common sense in this matter. That's what common law is. 
And that is the position with that. So that's where we are on that. And again, like I say, I've been, I've been fighting this battle for many, many years. You know, I don't know who you know, you know me or not, but, you know, I was pretty much a free spirit and I was pretty much a Dell boy. You know, I used to just, I didn't hurt anybody. I mean, yeah, but I mean, I was just wheeled and dealed and did my own thing. I didn't pay taxes. I didn't collect any dull money. I just did my own thing. And when my father died as an only child, I inherited a, a, a huge estate, which my father left me. And then all of a sudden, I got parasites on the doors. You know, every, who are these people? Why, what do they want of me? Who are these characters, you know, for council tax? We've got like 27 properties, and they're coming at me all the time. And I'm, what, what, why do I owe you this? So I, basically, I did it from a child's perspective. I didn't understand. And I genuinely didn't understand, because I'd never been involved in that system. And of course, so I then started fighting it, you know. Because obviously, money's not the name they came. I mean, look. If I want to be known for anything, it's to be for being a good father and a good grandfather and a good son. Right? What, what goes on out there is just a game, isn't it? Yeah? And that's all it is. Nothing more than a game. Yeah? So I started trying to, and look, I don't care. You know, look, Neil's the same, and, and Rob, and, and put a gun at my head, be prepared to pull the trigger. Right? That's simple as that. Yeah? Because right is might. And right is might. If we walk down the road and there's a little old lady and we bump into her, there's a gang of us, and she goes, oh, she starts wagging her finger at us, we know we're in the wrong, we back off. And right is might, yeah? And, if we're, and we know that we're in the right. What did happen with me, personally, was going from the common law situation, which, again, when you're talking about highbrow stuff to the magistrate, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's correct, but it just don't work. Because you need three law lords there to even interpret it, and then you wouldn't trust them, you know what I mean? But going from that perspective to going to the nitty-gritty of their own codified language, which is what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with their codified language, changed the whole situation and the whole perspective of it. So all of a sudden, the backgammon board is still there, but I've got the chess board. And what ultimately happens is this. When you go into the, the chess match with them, the best you can get them in is, stale, is, is stalemate, really. Right? Because when you win a court case, so in criminal law, say you were up for a burglary, and you might say that you weren't there, it was your mate who did it, or whatever it was, ultimately, the jury find you, if the jury finds you not guilty, you don't get a decision based on that not guilty verdict. The jury in this country doesn't say, we found him not guilty because we thought he, was, he had an alibi, or we thought he was not guilty because his friend said that he did it, or whatever, right? You just found not guilty, so you don't actually physically get an answer to why you were found not guilty. That in itself causes a little bit of a problem, because I could be taken to court for something based upon a certain amount of evidence, but when it actually goes to court, I get acquitted, I can't go around to you and say, hey, look, that's why I was found not guilty, that's why I was found not guilty, because nobody knows. The jury is in, it, it, absolutely in camera, not allowed to explain that to anyone in this country. What we have discovered, though, and which, you know, the boys up here have, have done brilliant work on, we've discovered that the court documents are fraudulent. Now, Mr. Ebert, again, has written this book, The, the uh, Forensics of Legal Fraud. And he was a man who owned over a thousand properties in Liverpool back in the 90s and had them all stolen off him. Through the process that's going on, to all of us now. And of course he's been fighting it ever since then and been taking these things apart forensically. And so he's written this book. And if you write a book, a book of fact, and it doesn't get challenged, you can then become an expert in that book, which is what's happened with him. So we are able to call upon this gentleman, if necessary, to be an expert witness, to forensically analyze this document. They will not call a rebuttal witness. And we know they won't call a rebuttal witness because they'd have to stand under it themselves under it and full commercial liability. So what we have is this. <coughs> and again, I'm not as organised as Neil, right? So I haven't got no notes, as it were. I've just got bits of paper and I've been doing it for years. <laughs> and I should be more organised, but I am, right? Blame Linda, something. Oh, I've been here. <laughs> you, might, you might wonder why this strange woman's here. <laughs> right? So this right, is what so I'm going to say, right? Now remember, these are two important things as far as I'm concerned, because all I'm trying to do is boil things down to their sulfurous element, right? So, you don't really need to know much else, right? If you know that abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence, mark that one up, because any time you're involved in all these, anything in court, it's going to be in their statutory process. And most of the people you're dealing with 
they say, oh, no common law, you're a, no common sense, I won't go, oh, I'm going there, mate, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> no, there's no common law, I'm going, you know, but, but abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. Now, ultimately, because in their, in their codified language, A plus B plus C equals D, if you take out one of the pluses or one of the numbers, it doesn't apply, and that's why you have to apply the codes to them. And again, this is why people have taught me, and I'm being trained in this language. But also what we've got to look at is this. When you, they're actors, you see, all these policemen, he wakes up in the morning, he might be doing, a, he might go to the toilet, he's not a policeman then, right? He's, he, he, he's acting his, in his capacity as a policeman when he's a policeman. Same as a judge, same as anybody else, right? But this is what we've got to remember. So abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. And this is the next one. Acting upon documents that you're not prepared to stand under in your professional acting capacity creates personal liability. Right? So, very, very important. When you have an actor in front of you, not another human being, a man in an acting capacity, or a woman in an acting capacity, acting upon documents that they're not prepared to stand under in their professional acting capacity creates personal liability for them. So what are we saying? Well, with us, recently, we had a... I was inherited a manor house, and I had 70 police, bailiffs, helicopter... The whole nine yards, right? Come to we, me and Linda got a, a, a phone call. We no notice, nothing at all. These seventy coppers and bailiffs, they put a, a porter cabin, they're running around the gaff. So we were able to get back, in, and, and they did it when my son took, took up my grandchildren to school. It's a property we own for thirty years. We haven't got a mortgage on. And then, but they've seized the property because they're trying to put their foot on my head, big time, right? <laughs> and we're talking, we're talking properties probably probably worth a couple of million in reality. Right? So we got in there, and of course I said to them, first thing I said, I'm not, in, I'm not interested in the story anymore. We took them by surprise. We took them by surprise, they didn't they know, so I just turned up there and said, right well, boys, what's going on? So he said, oh, right, okay, we're here to uh, evict you, we're called, and guess what, it's the name of the company was called? UK Evict. There's a company, right, in this country, called UK Evict. Check them out. It's Welsh. Eh? It's Welsh. Yeah, well, they went through. They, 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 so that's what happened. Right? So not ultimately, I said, right, give me the call, give me the document. What, what statutory instrument are you executing on me? So they gave me, gave me this. And again, I'm not, I'm not organised enough for that. And it's a writ possession, 66, well, and it should be a 69 because they should have gone for assistance and all the rest of it, right? And then what we do is, and uh, you know, we've got, a, we've got a, a firm called Alpha Forensics, which when we forensically analyse this stuff. Mr. Everett's the gaffer, really analysing the documents. Myself and David and that, we're doing what we do in, in the middle, and I'm learning in the meantime. When you go through these documents, you find that they're pathetic. Because it's written on, a, it's facts. That's what it is. The courts, now that's a court, that's, that would be a court seal if it had a date in it. <coughs> but it's upside down. And it's got no date in it, it's been removed. Because they'll always leave something out so we can't, they, nobody's accountable for it. There's no signature, it's got no high court number. And then it says, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, um, is commanding us to leave the premises. Well, Elizabeth II is written in block capital letters because Elizabeth II is a private corporation operating for profit and not the Queen. Although they're purporting to be the Queen. Right. Right? And it says the writ was issued on, and they haven't got the date. <coughs> And of course, the guy who witnessed this document is called the Right Honourable Christopher Grayling MP, High, <laughs> High Chancellor, but he's not but his signature. And then again, the schedule's all wrong. The whole thing is just, it's just a piece of paper that they printed out. Yeah? And if you accept that, yeah. look, it's yours. Fair enough. You know, you give me the keys to your car. I'm off. Right? Okay? And, and, and you're mug enough to do it. When you analyse and you go through this, it doesn't stand up to any sort of scrutiny. So. What we've done in this instance, I was very calm and collected, but what they did was, they said, are you going to leave the property? Uh, I said, well, no, you should leave the property. I want to see the police officer. I said, this is a fraudulent instrument. I can tell you, I said, only as a student, because I didn't know all the ins and outs of it at the time, because when you look at these things, you think that's a simple piece of paper. When you get someone like Mr. Ever on it, you find out, I could look at that for two months and not come out with the stuff that you'll find on it. Right? Okay? And, and I mean that, genuinely, it, uh, awesome. And so I said, this is a fraudulent instrument. And the cop said, I'm, happy. I'm satisfied that it's correct. And they were filming me. All these bailiffs were filming me. So I said, 
So you're standing under that document, son. He said, said, no problem to me then, right? And then six pages picked me up and carried me off the premises, right? And luckily, the local papers who were, who were okay and they, they know me have, have done an article, man carried from premises. Well, that's brilliant <coughs> because it shows that I haven't offered any manufactured consent. They've not manufactured my consent in any way, shape, or form. They've removed me based on this. So, of course, this document then has been sent to the Home Office. It's been sent to Christopher Grayling because he's a witness in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, you know, he's going to be pretty commercially liable if he, if he says that's the correct document. And so we, th we then throw the ball back in their court, which we did years ago, is a thing called negative averments, right? But then they, oh, I'll accept that's legitimate, providing you sign a document under full commercial liability that it is in your acting capacity. Otherwise, if you don't, then you're fully commercially liable in your personal capacity. And of course, so that's why they won't. And a, a case that Neil's in, in, in for, out me with, the one I was saying about, is the one that really started the ball rolling for me. Because for years I've known, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. You know, when you look at law from the common law perspective, which should have been the roots of this stuff, you think, how do they get away with this stuff? Um, I had a court case in, um, it was to Crane Court. Ultimately, what happened is we owned a, uh, a little trading estate, and I was falling out with the electric companies and all that. And British Gas supplied the unit, the units, uh, five units, but the land all around it was supplied by Empire, and I had no one on the land. And I found out the British <coughs> Gas, and they said I owed them seven grand. So I, was, I stopped paying, was in dispute, and they cut the electric off. So what I did, I connected with a, a, a armored cable from the end power supply into my uh, into the other units so it's coming off the end power supply now end power would give me electric for nothing at the time the reason being when my father died myself and linda went through uh, forensically through his bills and discovered that on another property uh, uh, an old pub for five years my father had been paying both british gas and end power as direct debit for the same property and so they owed us 20 grand. And I couldn't get the 20 grand from them. They, were, they weren't playing this game at all. They weren't lucky to take it. They, they were, and they put me in touch with some bloke, and then three weeks later he'd be gone, and there'd be some new bloke on the phone. Oh, how can we help you? And off we went again. So this went on for a long time. So I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll just connect up from the end power, and I'll get me 20 grand back off them that way mm -hmm. by, by doing it through the. Now, I was doing it in them days as a lien. And I, and I understand the lien from in the 1980s when, when a solicitor told me what a lien was. So that's what I did. And of course, and I thought, after about three or four years, I can then equate the bill. But of course, it didn't happen, because three years later, British Gas ring me up and say, we've broken into your premises, we've taken your meter, which is my meter, it was a landlord's meter, and we've cut off the supply. <coughs> of course, I've gone down there, so it's not, it's not British Gas supplying me, but I end up getting arrested. So I home, and I get arrested by like, five vehicles with police officers and all the rest of it, right? But only because when I was a younger man, I was a bit rowdy, but as an older man, I'm 50 now, I, I ain't into all that. You know, I'm not, I'm not up for it, I'm not 20 anymore, 30 anymore. But they come around and arrested me. So ultimately, when the police arrested me, I realized that they didn't know who was, they couldn't, they didn't know who was supplying me, they wouldn't arrest me. They're just going on what British Gas have said. So I asked for the warrant. And they said, oh, we've got the warrant yeah, in the case. I said, well, Look, that was the statutory instrument that warranted my arrest. Can you please produce it? Oh, senior, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on the interview. We'll just produce it. Oh, oh no, we haven't got it. Well, British gas guy. What's well, so good? Then your arrest is unwarranted because you've arrested me based on something that you haven't got. So I said, and what I, what I used to say to the police in Hereford, they're quite educated on it now, is a little phrase, just for a laugh, right? But I'd I say to people to say it, right? I said, what? Do you stand on the man car? Yes. Oh, no, no, yes. Do you know Article 45? Yes. Not off the top of my head. Right, well, Article 45 states that all officers, paraphrasing, officers, bailiffs, and sheriffs of the law shall know the law. And if you don't even know there's a law that says you should know the law, <laughs> then how can you possibly interview me about this? In well, and, and it's all got glossed over. So then we go into it, and they don't produce the document. So I'm saying the British gas don't supply me, Blah, 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 blah. And this went on for months. So I was charged with abstracting £12,000 of electric. So they charge me, they uh, bail me. And of course, I won't accept police bail because police bail doesn't actually exist. My police bail is, is fraudulent. Um, pardon? I didn't sign the bail. No, Linda didn't. Uh, Linda got arrested as well. 
And when I say it's fraudulent, what I mean is it doesn't, it doesn't apply to PACE, which is what they're operating under. And if you're arrested for something, and there's a co case called the Salford case, which you can check out, which proves this, in back in, after we did the judge arrest thing in Birkenhead years ago, um, Rusty was on bail for uh, the guy who'd done the thing with the judge. And uh, I represented him because he fell it off. And uh, he didn't sign for any bail. And if you don't sign for it, then you're not consented to it. And so if you say, well, I'm not consenting to bail, charge me or let me go. You also, and, and there's a guy in Salford who, in a, in a multiple occupancy property, there'd been a murder, and they arrested everybody. The police walk in, arrest everybody, <laughs> and bail them all to appear in a month while they investigate. And the one guy said, no, no, I'm, I'm not being bailed. You know, I haven't done anything. So they took him to court. And of course, it was firmly established then, in law, that since 1986, the police have been operating completely out of their remit. Yeah? Because... He's not on bail, and I, so I did the same, Linda did the same. Not on bail, not signing for him. So I was supposed to go back a month later, so they're ringing me up, you know, where are you? What do you mean, what do you want me for? I'm not, I'm not on bail, I haven't consented to it. So then they left notes on my gate saying, please be a good fellow, and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> o ultimately, they, they turned up with like, uh, again, like five or six cars, van loads, and then they dragged me off. <clears throat> and then they made me appear in court. Court bail's a different thing, so, so I went to court and then I did consent to bail because I knew there was going to be a criminal charge against me. So the criminal charge was um, obstructing £12,000 worth of electric. So, uh, fine. So I told them at the time there's, there's no prima facie case, there's no evidence. You know, there's and they're saying, well, basically, well, where do you get electric from? Well, it's, not, it's not my job to tell you. you know, I know where I'm getting it from, but I don't have to tell you. We're not in, you know, this isn't corpus juris. We're not in, we're not in France. So I'm not telling you. So it went all the way to a crank court trial where I had a jury. And that was when I met Neil, and he said to me, get into the forensics and all the stuff, rip what well, the nitty gritty, which I did. And then comes something very, very interesting. Because at one of the cases, I knew this was a fraudulent instrument. And I knew it was, because it's, this is what was supposed to be a, um, a right of entry gas and electricity board warrant, uh, 1954 right of entry warrant. But when I looked at it, I could see on the bottom it says, a, a Centrica business, British Gas Trading. So they've written it on their own notepaper. And when I looked at the signature on it, I could clearly see that it was the same handwriting as the bailiff who'd written handwritten notes saying that I, you know, what I'd done, or what I hadn't done. So I could see that they'd written this out themselves. So I thought, well, that's very interesting. You know, they've written out their own warrant. Now, they didn't give me that, the police, at first. In fact, it took me six months to get it. And the way, reason it took me six months to get it was because I went down to the court as a private criminal prosecutor, which we can all do, every one of us, and I said I want to initiate proceedings because I've tried it before against judges uh, for unlawful administration of their oath, contrary to Section 30 of the Statutory Declaration Act, and not being successful. But I said I want to initiate proceedings against British Gas for burglary. So we had their case against me and my case against them, as it were. And ultimately, I went in front of a judge, and he said, oh no, we're gonna deal with their case first. But if but if you if you get found not guilty of it, then you're fully entitled to come back and we'll review the evidence. So, all right. I then was on, I was then on bail for that court. I was then for two years. So for two years, we had a court case going on where I had to have a crown court trial. So I then employed my previous criminal solicitors, who are very good people from Bristol, and say, look, you have to get this thing sorted. Because what we've got at the moment is we've got a... Uh, I'm being told I'm going to get two years in prison if I'm found guilty for obstructing this electricity. There's no proof that there's any electricity being obstructed. There's not, there's no, but never mind British Gas don't supply anybody because they're a Berlin agent and don't supply anybody. But I was getting it from somewhere else. So I said, I'm going to employ you to get rid of this problem for me. But come the death went to the Crown Court. I won't plead or anything because I've got nothing to plead for. Why would I plead not guilty? I've got nothing to defend. I haven't done anything. This went on for two years and ultimately the, the barristers weren't able to get rid of it. The barrister wasn't able to get rid of it. Uh, so it still carried on. So then it said, right, if it comes back to me, then it's going to be me and Linda dealing with it. Linda organised, me not organised. But again, <clears throat> I know from, I've probably, and I'm not exaggerating, I've probably had probably not for a thousand court cases since I was a child. And I, and I don't say that lightly. I, I spent 
60 days in a, at the Old Bailey on a trial for unlawful uh, um, uh, conspiracy to uh, uh, rob the uh, uh, American uh, Federal Reserve dollars, yeah. dollars of counterfeit charges. So I don't know, that's sort of like, not just 60 days, just in one go. So I, mean, I was a younger man, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't dishonest, you know, I, robbed, I was dishonest, but I robbed the banks, I wouldn't rob the human beings, yeah. Robin Hood. Yeah, it was, yeah, Robin Hood. Is <laughs> but, but anyway, but that, so that's what the situation was. So I don't, and I mean that, and I, so I had plenty of, plenty of practice on that. So that was my, my thing. So they weren't able to get rid of it. So I've always said this, right? I'm happy to go in front of a jury, like I'm here in front of you now with no notes, right? Because hopefully what I'm saying is just, I'm just saying it straight off, you know, telling you the truth, yeah? And I know when you're in front of a jury, I mind you, I've been found guilty by juries, but... But, usually when I've been guilty, but I know that empathy is for the jury, humanity for the humans, yeah? But when dealing with the codified system, which is what Neil was talking about, the codified system, you need the codes. Because it's a completely different thing altogether. But it's very rare you get in front of a jury. So, I was happy that I was going in front of a jury. What they were trying to tell me was that, oh, you're going to go to that jury, it's going to be two years. Well, at the end of the day, myself and Linda went there. And something very interesting happened. This is what about this document here, and this is why I, you know, I, I'm, what's going on here with fraudulent court instruments. I had to go down because I represent myself for a meeting with the Crown Prosecutor. His name was Mr. Connolly. 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 So there was gangs in there, so I had to go down for a, a, a talk with him about a hearing. They were supposed to have a, have a court case. When I went down there to talk to him, I said to him, "Right, this is a fraudulent instrument which I've already brought to the attention of the magistrate." Well, Justice of Peace, a judge, and it's forged instrument. I said, and I noticed it's in the in the bundle against me, the committal bundle, which contained all their statements and everything else. He said, yes. I said, are you going to use that against me in, in, in the court? He said, yes. I said, it's fraudulent. He said, that's your opinion. I said, maybe my opinion. Are you prepared to stand under that document? He said, are you prepared to certify the veracity of that document? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, because I don't have to. I said, you're not, I said, you're not James Bond. It's not really a license to kill. Yeah? He said, I've got, I've got crown immunity. I said, that doesn't really exist. You do know that. You can't use fraudulent instruments and, and try and convict me of a crime. So I said, no problem. I'm going to tell the jury, and the judge, maybe he even knows himself, that that is a fraudulent instrument and that you're not prepared to stand under it. No problem. So we got adjourned. Did we didn't have the trial. Right? When we did have the trial, uh, three months later, well, the date, the date of the trial, we went there again, things changed. <coughs> when we went there, the prosecutor disappeared. Well, I saw him and I said, oi, because I wanted to talk to him about something, and, and he went off. So I went into the, 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 the uh, barrister's room, you know, they're all there with their gangs and acting. Where's Connolly? I want to talk to him, you know, about this. Oh, he isn't there. So myself and Linda and, and the people that were there, David and that were there, went into the court. So we went in there, like, ready for it, let's go for it. Yeah. We're ready for, there's going to be a jury sworn out now. And I'm going to say that this is a fraudulent instrument. Right? And the prosecutor knows, what he, if he doesn't know, he shouldn't have it in the bundle. If it's not correct. Of course, then the, the, a new prosecutor turned up. So the other one's legged it, he's gone. And then the new prosecutor said, oh, I've only just received this case. And, uh, and um, I'd ask for a two-week adjournment. But uh, uh, I know that, judging on your previous comments to the judge, that... Um, you, you won't be happy about that. And, uh, and he said, no, I certainly won't. He said, uh, you know, you're either going to sort it out today or not. So he said, 15-minute uh, adjournment, are you prepared for that? Yeah, no problem. So we went out, case dismissed, right? They, they, were, they, they, they bottled it well, before the jury came out. Literally, so for two years, I was on bail, threatened with two years imprisonment on something that they pulled the plug on at the last second before the jury gets warned. So I got ward awarded costs against the Crown Prosecution Service, because the judge said to the, to the prosecutor, you know what, diff what, what problems this is going to cause? And he said, yeah. And he said, right, he said, I award all its detainers costs against the Crown Prosecution Service. So we got a court order for the costs, and that's not, that's not for anything else other than the costs that it cost me in that matter, which we put in. We then got a court seal, because when it goes, <laughs> when you get costs order, you see what a court seal is. And it's an embossed seal, or it's been, and it's got the date in the middle, and it's got the case, the court number around it. Because when it gets, when you get a costs order, 
it goes through the, what they call the taxing office in every court. They give it to the taxing office, and they, so it all has to be correct. There can't be no manufactured consent when it comes to them. It's only when it comes to us. So we, know, we knew what the court seal was. We knew what they were claiming. And we knew that they are not prepared to stand under their own documents. So we move this forward, and we, and, we, and, we, and we wind this on, because all of their documents are fraudulent. And I, I wouldn't have believed what I'm saying to you now six months ago. You know. Mr. Everett would be say, happy to talk on Rob on camera. He can't come because on a, between Friday and Sunday he has a religious ceremony. That's what you do. He's, he's, he's Hebrew. They're all fraudulent. And there's nothing I have seen to suggest otherwise. They have no seal. They have no signature. So they're in breach of, as Neil stole my thunder from 40.2 or whatever. Right? <laughs> but, 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 and if you look into the... Now, so they're all guilty under the County Court Act, 1984, Section 135, which is very clear. Now, as Neil was rightly saying, because not many people realise this, when you go... It's the fraud that he was talking about there. You go to the Magistrates' Court, in the, under the cloak of thinking you're going to a court when really it's a civil matter, it's a perversion of the two. And it all stands under the County Courts Act, Section 135, which is using instruments purporting them to come from a county court. Seven years in jail. So, right, okay, yeah, I'll finish the story again about. Right, so ultimately what's happened is, what happened is this, okay, so they're all guilty of that. Because they're all given us fraudulent documents. But what the situation is this. So when they found me not guilty, the judge found me not guilty, even though there wasn't a jury, he said, I'm finding you not guilty and I'm awarding you costs. Brilliant. I left there. So what I did then, I thought, now, what they expect you to do really is just say to think, oh, God, lucky I got off that. Right? But if you haven't done nothing wrong, you don't feel like that. You just feel pissed. Yeah? So what I did, I got what they call the, the committal papers, which is the bundle they were using against me. And I took out their statements, because obviously their statements say that they entered premises and all the rest of it. So that's, the, that, that's, that's, that's confessions. And I took out the pictures of my meter, and a, a fantastic guy called Michael Doherty, who's been doing proper the prosecutions in this country. He's a friend of mine for a, long, for a while now. He assisted me with it. And I created the legal framework to prosecute the two British gas bailiffs for burglary. So now I had to go before the same judge yeah. that had told me all that time ago that, oh, well, if you win your case, you can do this. So I went before him. And I'm thinking, I, I, I want to see him squeal, yeah, because, you know, I mean, <coughs> there used to be things on YouTube with the government ban now, me and him having conversations before. So I went in front of him, and he knew he was compromised because, because I had the legal framework set out properly. <coughs> I had evidence he's already said about it and he knows they're going to need you so and I, I laid it before him and he said oh I have to accept this yeah, and he said but Mr Taylor he said we've got it we've got it he said, um, you do realise that the Crown Prosecution can take this case on and bin it I said we'll cross that bridge when we come to it yeah but you do realise that you might be <coughs> nice I said no problem I said we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because I knew what the next thing was so he issued the summonses against the two British Gas senior revenue collectors for burglary. So we have a court date. So I'm fascinated now, because what's going to happen now? So Because they try to get, yeah, because yeah, what happened is when, when, I left the, when I got found not guilty and myself and David left the, left the Crown Court, the two bailiffs walked past me and they go, we'll see you in civil court. I said, no you won't, you see you in the criminal court, you'll be up for burglary and prints, right? And they walked off. But of course, now I have them charged. Brilliant, right? So, was it three, four weeks ago? We had so many court cases, who knows? But we've gone to Worcester Magistrates Court. They're supposed to appear for burglary. Well, when I go there, they call them. They're not there. So I go in, they say, Mr. Prosecutor, they, fair play, they call Mr. Prosecutor. The CPS moved over there. Mr. Prosecutor. Stood in the prosecution seat, right? Okay, always. And there's there's a barrister there, and I'm thinking, uh, who's this? Oh, she's she's not representing them. She represents British Gas. She's not a party to the action, really, is she? But no, she represents British Gas. Uh, but, and because we sent the summonses to British Gas to, to, to service on them, but they haven't got them, the judge goes. Why not? Well, because they don't know their home addresses. Well, basically, I'm thinking, 
hang on, she's an officer of the court, so she should be telling you the address. <laughs> but anyway, it's all gone on. So the judge said, oh, I don't know what to do. He said, well, I don't know what to do. He's used to dealing with the police. He's used to dealing with the police and the CPS, not private prosecutions. I said, well, look, I'm a reasonable man. I said, no, no. said the police normally deal with these matters. He so said, the police normally deal with them. Well, unfortunately, we're all the police. The police haven't got the monopoly on policing the state. Same as the CPS haven't got the monopoly on prosecuting the state. Each one of us is a policeman. Each one of us is a crime prosecutor. And we have to realise that and wake up to it. So that's what, what went on. So he said, oh, I don't know what to do. So he said, well, maybe you can have a lay bench. No, no, I'm quite happy with you, really. You know, but it, it went on. So, so I said, well, listen, I'm a reasonable man, so let's adjourn, it, let's adjourn it. He said, six weeks. And I said, but if they don't turn up, I want a bench warrant for their arrest. Because I know it's a criminal charge. And if I didn't turn up for a burglary, bench warrant. Simple as that. There's no other angle. Like. So uh, that's what went on. So it's been adjourned. But then before that, he said to the crank, to the CPS, because he was confused, man. He said, remember I said to you about him, the CPS can take the case and dump it? He said, uh, CPS, he said, uh, do you want to take this case? I said, well, can we just stop there? I said, the CPS are conflicted in this matter and compromised. Because ultimately, the CPS are the ones that dragged the case on against me for two years. I said there was no prima facie evidence against me. And I asked for an old style committal, which you, I, I, I said to you, I was entitled to, even though you believe it or not, I'm not. And you ignored that. And so they're compromised because they took a case against me and maliciously pursued it for two years before withdrawing at the end because there was no evidence. But there was no evidence, on a few reasons, but because they're dealing with fraudulent documents. An abusive process is... A common law offence. Abuse of statutory process is a common law offence. And acting, as, acting in your professional capacity as, your, as an actor, if you're unable to support your position, then you have personal liability for it. So the whole thing just run... So now I've got a court case... Uh, well, we've got a court case against uh, British Gas Bayless... 24th of May. On the, on the 24th of May, is it? Yeah. Um, where if they don't turn up, then there'll be a bench warrant for their arrest. But I know what the crack is. Well, this is the school. When you think about it. What's happened is this. There, now, if, you're a, if you work for a company or a corporation, you're an actor, yeah? you're, whether you be a policeman, whether you be a lawyer, whatever you are, you're acting in that capacity. If you operate outside the boundaries afforded you by legislation or break the law, you're no longer that actor. You are your own person. Now, so what that meant is, when British Gas sent a, 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 a lawyer there, why are they there? Because you can't be a British Gas revenue collector if you break the law. The moment you break the law, you're yourself and can be arrested for it. You, know, you can't be a policeman and burgle somewhere. It, you can't. The moment you burgle that property, you're now you. Because you can't, it won't be recognised in your acting capacity. So this is where we are with these people. And the, the, they're now stuck in that sort of that sort of um, stalemate position with me, as far as that's concerned. So, where have you gone that one? Well, I said the clerk of the court's on your side. Yeah, yeah, well, so, right? yeah, yeah, so, so again, I need the props. So, the clerk of the court, I rang the clerk of the court, who, who's brilliant in Hereford, <coughs> very nice guy. I've known him 30 years ago when I was a young tearaway, and I was, you know, I used to do stuff and be carried in an army. I find that funny now, when I, I had a fight and committed criminal damage at a nightclub back in the, the early 80s. And uh, they've taken all my clothes for forensics, and I've been caught in an orange boiler suit in 1981. You know, well, no, I don't know, orange boiler suits, you know, it's a bit, you know, long time ago, isn't it? But I've known him since then, and this, this guy, uh, you know, I rang him up the other day, and he said, There's only one thing to do procedurally if people don't turn up for criminal charges, bench warrant. And he said, If I'd been the clerk that day, that's what I would have told you that you had to do. Never mind what the judge said, bench warrant. So we've got people working inside the courts that they just, want to, they just want to do their job. And that's why I say about the culture. It's the culture. You know, it's these people, oh, that's the way it is. And after five years of doing a job the way it is, you just think that's the way it is, yeah? And British guys, they probably think, oh, that's what we do. We go and get a, we go and get a fax or a, a printout, and we, so of course, this is where I was going. What do the British gas guys do? They've got, they've got a, a, a summons for burglary. Two of them, right now. So they've gone to their bosses and said, what the is this? And they've said, oh, nothing to do with us. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they've gone, what? But that's what we do five days a week, eight hours a day. <coughs> How can this be burglary? 
But if it's burglary, they've got about a thousand TICs, you know, taking into consideration on it, aren't they? So, because they don't know. So this is where we're doing. We're educating these people. And this is what it's all about. We're educating them. And I, I, I personally can't believe where we're at now. You know, the last, I, when I started doing this stuff years ago, I felt like it was Dad's army on acid. I was a young one, you know what I mean? And we had like, you know, we had people far older and wiser than me on it. And I just thought, Christ, you know, I'm the young one here. And nobody, but yeah, there's young people interested in all this stuff now. And there's, there's people, you know, and, and it will catch on very, very quickly. So you can talk about the corporations being given quarterly Yes, yeah, right. So yeah, that's the bottom line. What's, what, we're just, what we've discovered, and, you know. So case we had with the, the, the Right, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, so what, all the cases I had, I, um, Mr. Everett's been training me in sort of legal forensics, which again, you know, and, and I'm trying to look at it from a, all I'm trying to look at it from a common law perspective is a common sense perspective, you know? But he gave me strike outs, and as, as again, as Neil was saying, you know, he's, he's too clever for some good. <laughs> Everything I say is he's already said. But what you, what, you, what you do, what you do on it, is on your strike outs, yeah, what you do is, right, if you're trying to strike out any civil action, you can do it. It doesn't matter if it was 15 years ago. If you, since that strike, since that action, found out that there was false, false misleading, misleading inaccurate. and inaccurate information supplied to that case, you can ask for it to be struck out as an abusive process. So it doesn't matter how old the case is, you can ask for an abuse. You can ask for it to be struck out. <coughs> so. What we did is, I had court cases against Barclays Bank, the official receiver, and uh, a, a, a trustee receiver. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I had all these three cases. So what they did is, they, they put all the three cases together, and they put it in a crown court to try and frighten me, because of course I've gone down the stairs for five years before in any places. And, and so we all appeared a few weeks ago for this trial, uh, and they have three barristers, three lawyers, and myself and Linda, and you know, all the public gallery was with us, but in this place, with a judge who hates you, you he's, he's a QC, and he should be a, a judge, because at the end of the day, people's lives are in his hands, you know, he could do you for murder, yeah? But I, he doesn't like me, and he was there, and I was there, and we went through it. And farce, again, you know, absolute farce, and if, if it, you know, because there's no way they could they could support their position. It is uh, as a solicitor that I a solicitor that I've been involved with um, charged me twenty thousand pounds for something. But I'd been in prison with this guy in the eighties, so I knew he'd been done for nicking speedboat engines. His name's Michael Hall and Kidwells and everything. And he'd been done for nicking speedboat engines. Well, then on another occasion when he took me to court, uh, I said, "You've been done for nicking speedboat engines." in jail with me back in the 80s. How can you be a solicitor? And he says, oh, and the judge said, well, the same judge now, said, uh, at this hearing, said, is that correct? He said, yeah. And he said, have you had any other convictions? He said, oh, yeah, benefit fraud. Right. <laughs> now, the judge at that moment should have said, well, you went a solicitor. Right? But he didn't. He let the thing go on. And he ended up, let, because I was giving the, everyone such a sort of stick, he ended up letting that, that say, finding in his favour, not mine. But of course, when you go through the, uh, the SRA regulations, the uh, standard entrance, you can't have criminal convictions. So he's not a solicitor. And this is where you go to the technicalities and the forensic details of things. If he's not a solicitor, then any cost orders he's put in are not costs. Because documents false if circumstances absent. And that's, a, that's an appeal court ruling. So documents are false if the circumstances are absent. Well, the circumstances are absent because you're not a solicitor. You can't put solicitor's cost in. The whole thing falls apart. But of course, the judge is prepared to support his position. So you immediately know that the judge is up to his neck in this. And in fact, the 20 grand bill that he'd given me on the previous occasion was probably due to the fact that he probably got a backhander off it. Yeah. Because what we're finding, and what we're finding all over the UK is, I can tell you, in certain areas of this country, or cases that we're dealing with, if it's a bankruptcy or if it's um, uh, something to do with a, a repossession, I can, ver I can tell you which judge is probably going to appear at that hearing. Oh, maybe I'm psychic. No, maybe there are a load of bounty hunter judges that go around taking these cases on. That's the bottom line. Yeah, this is what we've got. So we've got proper, proper corruption and fraud going on in this country. Absolutely, you know.
undeniably. And it's going on everywhere. And, and like I say, so what we started to do is what we uh, said was, let's get out, because Mr. Everett's been saying about the fraudulent documents for years. Yeah, but I mean, nobody's been doing anything about it. And, and Neil's been doing all the stuff on, 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 and that's what got me really into that. We can take them apart inside their own game. So we put the, we put the backgammon board there, we put the chess board there, and then all of a sudden they tip the ball up. Ooh. We won. Uh, well, yeah. And you haven't won. It's a bit like, have you ever seen, do you ever, I don't know if any of you watch a cartoon called Family Guy. It's an adult cartoon. Right? And there's an episode that I thought was perfect for this. Lois, a, a, a cartoon man and his wife, he wants his wife to become a female boxer. She doesn't do that. You know what I mean? But what he does, he promises her a nice meal one night, and he puts a blindfold on her, and she gets all dressed up, he puts a blindfold on and surprises you. And he walks her to this arena, and oh, he's got to slip these, these silky gloves on. So she puts these gloves on, and ding, ding, she comes around, and she's in a ring, and she, someone's boxing her head off. Well, that's what's happening to us with the manufactured consent. Now, you're getting tricked into a position that your consent is manufactured, and you appear in this ring, and someone's boxing your head off. And the judge holds up the other person's hand and says, the winner! This one's the winner, right? The bank's the winner or whatever it is, right? No. Well, that's fair enough, right? You didn't even want to fight. <coughs> the reason the bank's the winner is because they've manufactured your consent. But is the judge prepared, is the referee prepared to sign a document to state it was a fair fight? No. Because he knows it wasn't a fair fight. That's why you don't get the signatures on these documents. That's why you don't get the court seal. That's why you don't, they'll leave stuff off it, right? And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, that's what's been going on with us. We've been, we're getting walked into an arena. For, if, 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 if myself and David here had a dispute, we say, okay, well, let's go to court about it. Yeah? Now, what happens then is we, we go there, we put our arguments, and we say, well, perhaps a judge, to act as an administrator in this matter, because he's not a judge, because he's not on his oath, he's an administrator, would be a good person to have. And so we call him in, and we agree, and, and he settles the dispute for us. And if I don't agree that he won on points, I can exhaust the process. I can go on and on and on until the process is exhausted, because that's my right. The judge is supposed to say, fine, OK, well, I believe that David won, not you, and, and the process gets exhausted. If they try and stop that by saying they're refusing you leave to appeal, that's an abusive process, which is a common law offence. And the whole thing goes back round and round again. And that's, that's exactly where we are with these people on that level. They've, they've manufactured our consent. We're involved in a fight that we don't even know we should be involved in. We should, well, I don't want to fight with you. Bang, bang. And the judge holds his hand up. Well, it's not a fair fight for a start. And if there's a criminal element involved, fraud vitiates all, it's all gone. But I mean, they've, they've been doing this for so long, and that's why I say about the culture, and I go back to what Mr. Everett says. It's the culture. Well, that's the way it is. You get one of these pieces of paper, that's good enough. And you get the old bill, you get the copper, eh? Well, I, I think it's right. But do you know the law? No, well, you don't. So, and the trouble is when they're dealing with the likes of us now, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And the reason is because it's common sense. We know the law. So when they come to our doors, they, they have to deal with 10 or 15 lawyers, as far as they're concerned. Because we know more about it than they do. They know nothing. And, and so we're trying to teach them what they should know. When they put me in the Crown Court, uh, they, they use three barristers and three solicitors. And I said the cases should be split up to three separate cases. And they said, no, 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 we're keeping all together. Right, so they feel better in numbers. And they put me in a, in a real court and all that, right? So he, the judge said to me, and we should, they won't give us the transcripts for them. He said, um, you're a criminal, Mr. Taylor. I said, no, I said, I was a criminal, perhaps 20, or thought I was, 20, 30 years ago, not, not in the same league as you guys. But, <laughs> you know, hey, listen, man, I was, just, I was just a little boy. But I said, no, but I do recognize criminals, all right? And all the barristers sat like this with their wigs on and all that. And the whole the whole thing went on, you know. And this is where they are with them. So you said that security was there? Yeah, but the security, when we went in there, and this is gospel truth, you know, uh, when we went into the court, and I won't say what court it is because I don't want to get security guys to talk, but when we went into the court, the, um, the security guy, the head of security, went to me and goes, oh, guy, blah, 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 he goes, you know, watches your stuff and what's oh, well, fine. And he goes, you know, we only do this for a job. If it really kicks off, we'll review. It's all brilliant to know. Because, I mean, who needs security? They never used to have security in these courts. 15 years ago, 20 years ago. The only people who need security are the insecure. Tony Blair's got 10 bodyguards. I mean, you know, not, Colonel Gaddafi was driving around the road waving at people before there was a revolution there. Nobody was pop shot him, were they? Yeah? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, the only. The, eh? The Pope's got a Pope mobile, but, but Bill Hicks says, 
you know, that's safe for him. You know what I mean? If you're a glass proof, little dopey drives around here. But, but that's exactly what's going on. You know, the, the insecure needs security. Why would you need security? What are you doing wrong? You know? Oh, there might be some good to it. Why are you someone going to ruin their life in prison or getting killed for you? Why are you that important, mate? Yeah? It's because you're insecure, right? Okay? And that's what you need it, because you're a wrong one. Simple as that. We're digging them out. We're digging them out. Before I forget that, because I'm going to go off. You know the, the, the Cyril Smith scandal and that up in uh, Rochdale? Yeah? You know all about that, yeah? Mm. And um, the fact that that uh, co op boss, that flowers, the, the one who's with the Red Boys, was, was operating a, a hostel for. Cyril Smith up there, or a boy's home for Cyril Smith up there, right? Okay, back in the 90s, yeah, when he was a minister, right? Funny thing is, my son's from Rochdale, I used to live in Rochdale, right, okay? But I didn't know till we came down, because, you know, it was a different life back in the early 80s. My son's 30, 32. And in 1993, my son was put in that home, Noel, right? School for a few days. But it wasn't called Noel, it was called Fox Holes. Fox holes. Now, have you ever watched Fox Fox cartoons? The Fox Channel. In between the in between the, the cartoons, it goes Fox Kids, Fox Kids, Fox Kids. They're taking the piss out of us, and I mean that. They're taking the piss out of us. Fox holes, and there's all that nonsense going on there. Sweet shot, they call it now. Sweet shot, but they don't tell you what it was called then. It was called Fox holes. Oh, because there's a lot of fox holes about the place, yeah. We're, they're taking the mickey out of us. We have criminals. Let me tell you something, right? I've been in, I spent eight years of my life as a younger man in jail, right? I recognise people when they're criminals, right? And people get very, very cocky, right? When they start getting away with shit, right? And start doing things like that, and then everyone else is ignorant to it. But trust me, so that's just a by the by, yeah? Calling it think something like that is very odd, and they don't mention it in any of the When you go to a solicitor, most people, you go with your story. So, oh, you know, I was ripped off, and this happened, and that happened. And you, and you carry telephone directories of your story to the solicitors. And the solicitors are going, oh, I'll make a few quid in this, holiday home here. Yeah. And you walk up the drive. Now, the point being, if you could take this document in there, I'm just giving that, well, this was the last document that was executed against me. And it was all based, so I was evicted based upon this. Well, there's no seal, there's no signature, there's no date. The whole thing would fall apart. Okay based on that. Never mind the story, but of course the solicitors, so they could tell you in half an hour and probably charge you £100 that that's completely incorrect and the whole thing should be booted out. And of course, no, no, we ain't going to do that. We want to deal with the story. And what the solicitors do is they deal with the story. And you think, well, okay, they're trying to make money and we know that solicitors are solicitors. That's what soliciting for sex is all about. They're prostitutes. That's why until the 90s, until Blair, they weren't allowed to advertise. Solicitors couldn't advertise because everybody knew they were, they were prostitutes. But they're, they're soliciting this stuff, right, okay? But they're not going to make no money on that. So they want the story. They don't want the hard facts of the documentation, which is what we're doing, and this is what the forensics of this, and we've been doing it pro bono, same as Neil. Give us the documents, we look through it, we'll analyse it, we'll tell you what's wrong with it, and basically, that's an abusive process. There's nothing else. If you're prepared to accept that document as being real and hand the keys to your car over, then tough shit. But ultimately, if you say that's a fraud, couldn't the Right Honourable Christopher Grayley please certify and attest the veracity of this instrument, yeah? And if he doesn't, then I will implied admission absent a response, and that's what we do, right? So on the end of every letter that you write to these people, there are a couple of things we write which we think helps everybody, right? So I'll tell you what it is, right? And at the end of you, give a, give a date and a timeline, if you think something's wrong, respond within 14 days or 10 days or whatever, and at the end we put this. Implied admission absent a response, which is perfectly legitimate to do. And we've recently seen in that case with that Flowers and that other guy, that if they don't answer the questions, they'll consider that they're liable. And the reason for that is, remember when they said that Tony Blair had got rid of the right to silence? Well, yeah, what they'd said is that a jury could take an inference if someone didn't respond. They're using that. They use that in the civil, they use it in the criminal, right? And at the very end, you request their compliance. Because they're public servants, they work for us. We request their compliance in this matter. So when going for court documents, you know, again, I've, I've written very nice letters to them saying, please supply court documents, and then five weeks later they give me um, 
A few papers that the judge has allowed me. Right? Well, no, not no more, since the forensic stuff's going on, you know. I request their compliance as per section 5.4.2 in brackets of the CPR. I request all their documents and I, and I, I will be supplied them within 48 hours as per, the, as per the codified law. So that's, you know, that's where we're going with all this stuff. But everybody who's getting this stuff, I have not, you know, I have not seen a legitimate writ of possession or bankruptcy order in the whole six months I've been doing it. And I mean that. There isn't one. They're all just stealing our properties. They're stealing everything off us and then saying, in history, poor old Joe over there, oh, he drunk his money away. He did this, he did that, yeah? Because everything's, everything's completely wrong. The land registry won't stand under any documents. You go <coughs> to the land registry if you've been robbed of a property, and you ask the land registry to stand under and certify and test the veracity of, 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 or authenticate any document. They won't. we just to register. Why? So you won't get authenticity from any of these parties. Now, I would, if I left here and someone said to me to swear that I was here, of course I'd sign the document and say I was here. And yeah, I've said it. Tough. So all I've said is, I've said, tough. oh, no, 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 well, I don't have to. Yeah. You're dealing with slippery twice. Like, exactly. And all this court documentation, everything we're getting off these people is fraudulent. Fraudulent. It can be proved. We can call an expert witness who will state it is fraudulent. They won't bring a rebuttal witness. This is the interesting thing. We can call an expert witness. This is a fraudulent document. And he'll say, swear, and the pain of perjury is a fraudulent document. Any rebuttal witness? No. And that's why what Neil said about the council tax with Rob and that, that's the situation. Pull them up on their documentation. It doesn't take a lot. You don't have to deal with the story. You know, I know people who've got horrific stories, but they're telephone directories. And that's what they want. They want the so story. The process, so you take the civil to the criminal prosecutor. Yes, now that's the final thought of area on this one. Is the civil, turn the civil into a criminal, right? Okay? Because at the end of the day, they're abusing it. They've abused the process and therefore they're committing a criminal offence anyway. There's fraud involved. Now, people think that, oh, yeah, but I have to take a call. You, right, a couple of things about criminal prosecutions, right? It doesn't cost anything, right? And I'll say this now because I'm happy I've actually got criminal prosecutions laid. In my capacity as a private criminal prosecutor, which is why I now tell them all, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I've gotten through. So I, I, I can say that to them. Uh, and in my... In my capacity as a private criminal prosecutor, I'm able to defend people. Because if the prosecution are bringing cases like they have against Grace in London, right, they've stolen her house, it's her name all over the documents, they've dragged her out there three times, they've arrested her, they've charged her with squatting in her own house, which under their own rules they can't do, right? But, so I'm so, I'm so outraged by this, I'm to, I'd be prepared to represent her, and I've got audience in the court, because in my capacity as a private criminal prosecutor, I've had audience, right? That's where we are. We prosecute these people. It doesn't cost one pence. Nothing. Every one of you who's got a problem with these characters could go to a magistrate's court. All I always do is a handwritten note, right? So it's coming off me, not coming off some saying I want to come in and I want to lay, lay an information. Yeah? I always get a response from the magistrate's courts because remember, they're real courts. The civil courts aren't real. They're fake. They're, they're just what, basically what we all agree to. But of course, we don't agree to getting raped and robbed by these characters. The criminal courts is where it's really at. It doesn't cost a single penny to lay a private criminal prosecution. You'll go there, you'll at least take up an hour of the court's time, right? The judge will probably try and say it's vexatious, there's loads of stuff that can knock that out. But ultimately, you could then go out the door and do it somewhere else. They can't say you're vexatious, and they can't use vexation against you in criminal matters. But they can with civil, they can say to you, you're not allowed to lay, you know, you're not, the, in their world, you're, you're a vexatious litigant and you're not able to, to come back to court. Wish they, they can't yeah. in the civil. They're the criminal. Yes. Wishing to become a cause celeb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there you go. If you've got a, I mean, look, at the end of the day, and this is where they try getting us again. So there's issues with the bank, right? There's issues with the bank. And again, yeah, look, ultimately. But the banks are supported by the judiciary, right? So that's not, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, they're criminals. If you look at Barclays sign, and if you put it red and black and white, it's a Nazi sign, isn't it? You, know, you think of the Blue Eagle, it, it, it's in your face, right? But what we do is we take criminal prosecutions. So I've got a criminal prosecution against Barclay and a bank manager on May the 14th, which I'm going to get laid, right? But where I'm going to take it is this. I'm going to take the easiest way, in some ways, ultimately, 
I'm going to try. I am going. I'm going to say it's the camera, isn't it? I'm going to charge you with terrorism. Right? Terrorism. A conspiracy to commit terrorism. Now, I've been charged with eight conspiracies in my life, and nobody found guilty of one because it's the easiest charging law to, to charge, but the hardest to prove. Right? And that's what they do. They chuck it out. Yeah. So I'm going to charge. I'm going to charge them back now. Do they fancy their chances in front of the jury? Good. I mean, what a bank man. What do you think the bank managers have been prosecuted? They have got no chance, right? So we're going to pursue this, and we're going to get them through this membrane that they've been holding back, and let the let the public decide. As I said in the Crown Court the other week, right? Well, okay, I'm happy to go in front of any jury of my peers, and if I find plead not guilty, and they find me guilty, I'll have to say that maybe I was deluded, or maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I have to accept it somehow. But not in front of you guys. You're all in the same gang. I don't know. It's, and that's what we're doing, we're dealing with cartels. And that's what we're dealing with, dealing with cartels. The SRA, the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority, we've got lawyers on the firm now, really, truthfully, who have been shut down because the SRA have decided they're helping the public. So the SRA go there, close them down, and steal all their customers. And so they're a cartel. I was doing, I was doing a cases over in Belfast for a guy against, get this, the Northern Irish Tours Board. And you think, wow, well, it was a cartel. The Northern Irish Tourist Board in, in Belfast, right, he owned a hostel in the city centre and they wanted him. And they, he wouldn't sell it. And so what they did, they went there with the police and fire brigade after an email from an, one email from a, an address in California and said that he had some problems in there. They went there with axes and axes, they went to the building, you know, it was all filmed, and then took him to court for breaching their rules and regulations. So I went there to Belfast on, on, five, on five different court cases, you know. And, and went to represent it, you know, and cause havoc, because over in Northern Ireland, they're pretty naive about what's going on, so I just go to court and say, and, and they, they're all there tooled up in there, with, and they're all, in the magistrate's court, they're all wearing wigs and that, it's, it's different to Europe, in Belfast, and I said, you're not a judge, this in a court. I said, I beg your pardon, because they thought I was in. I said, you're not a judge, this in a court. And of course, the public gallery is full of Irish people, because they make you go in the court and sit there, waiting for your case. So this woman goes, how dare you? I said, how dare you? I said, look, are you on your oath? I said, are you? I'll ask you one more time. Right? I said, right, if you are on your oath, I'm going to arrest you. For unlawful administration of your oath, contrary to section 30 of the statutory declaration, Act 1835. But if you're not on your oath, I'm going to arrest you. Impersonate a public official and avert the course of justice. Which is it? <laughs> oh, 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 we can't deal with this. Six weeks, right? So, a uh, of six weeks. So then, you know, they went back over with Roger Hayes, because I thought they were going to, they'll find out who I am, or whatever. And know how to work it. So I went back to Roger and let Roger do his Roger stuff. And then went back again, and then I did my stuff. And then we went back ultimately, and they just got the police, and we called the police to, to say there's going to be a gang of individuals in a private capacity that are going to put hands on us in a, in a matter that's not only is it civil, it's fraudulent because we can prove that this email is was basically they can't even call the email participant as a witness, and uh, they surrounded us and all the rest, and we had a few hours in there. But it was a joke because in the end, Roger, you know, in his Roger way, stood, said to the police. Officers, take out your notebooks. This man is guilty of treason. And the, <laughs> and the, the coppers took their notebooks out, and the judge goes, please don't. <laughs> and the coppers start going, what, like that? And of course, he pleaded with the court, you know, and he's like, whoa, what's going on? And of course, the coppers start looking at him, what's going on? You know, and the whole situation fell apart, you know? So, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we're dealing with characters. The trouble is, they've been, they've been operating in a culture where earning their two or 300 quid an hour Right? As, uh, uh, they don't bother looking at the law books or nothing like that. You get someone like, like Danny Albert and Rising, where you've got proper people who want to look at these books. They ain't interested. Well, why would you? There's a rubber stamp here. Rubber stamp's not no conscience. You know what I mean? It just rubber stamps away. Why would you look at these books? Why would you? We do. Right? So what we do is we are all becoming lawyers. And so they better make sure that when they come to us, they know what they're doing and they know what they're saying. Otherwise, we'll privately, criminally prosecute them, and all of us in this room could go to the uh, local magistrates and say we want to issue a private and stop them up for a week, just on us. <laughs> okay, and we could, we could do it. And they couldn't refuse us, and it wouldn't cost us a penny. It's completely out of their remit. They can't do anything about it. So, anyway, any more to say, Lynn? Listen, chaps, it's been great talking to you, yeah? And, uh,